Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my Photography 101 Live right here, right now. And uh, yeah, thank you for joining me back again. And it's been a while because this week I haven't done any live on Facebook. Uh, so yeah, it's been, it feels kind of like forever, you know, for some reason, because I've been doing daily stream uh, for the last month. Every week I've been doing daily stream and this week I just haven't uh, done any live at all apart from today. This is my very first live this week uh, because I have a lot of stuff to do and I just have to finish a couple of projects that I promised I had to finish in over the next uh, uh, week or so. So in the next few days I won't do any lives at all. So today is the only live this week. So, uh, But we've got interesting topics. You might have seen some of the titles already. You might have seen the teasers, pictures, and all the other stuff that I posted on social media. So yes, we are going to talk about some camera. Uh, of course, uh, 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 if you guys don't know, I'm an Olympus ambassador, so I use Olympus gears almost exclusively for both photography and videography filmmaking. Good afternoon, David. Yes, welcome. Yeah, like I said, this is live. Of course, everything's unrehearsed and uh, mistakes can happen. Things could be a bit weird. And uh, so if you can't hear me for some reason, if the picture suddenly freezes up, let me know and I will try to fix whatever I need to do. Uh, today's settings are a little bit generic and uh, they haven't done much at all. Uh, but I am using the EM1X to film me at the moment because uh, as you know, it has two batteries, so just in case it runs out, so at least I got two batteries to run, so that should be good for more than an hour and a half, but I'm not gonna do that long, you know, so, so that should be okay. Good morning, guys, very, very good. So Patrick Huber and Evic from Singapore. Wow, cool, awesome, Singapore, yeah. Right, okay, so we're gonna have, uh, have a few things to talk about today because uh, I have, uh, I mean, some of you might have, have already seen the news about the latest Canon announcement of the latest flagship of the flagship camera on the mirrorless side, the R system. They have the R5 just announced. So this is today's topic uh, because I want to talk to you guys about that, more specifically about how it compares to the Michael Four Third and Olympus in general. So, um, you know, it could be, could be quite fun debate and, and discussion. So let's, let's, let's go crack on. So today's topic, of course, uh, like I, what I usually do, I'll have a channel update and I'm going to talk about you know today's topic and then have a Q&A or you can just have any questions you can answer uh, ask me straight away if I see your comment coming out from my comment box there I will uh, answer accordingly but uh, like I mentioned before the comment box does take a little bit of time to to populate in my program here because I'm not actually seeing uh, uh, my stream live on YouTube at the moment I'm using a separate program to do this streaming thing so uh hopefully it's all good anyway uh, matt from detroit hey cool right got quite a few people going on so that's awesome so let's get crack on now so channel update uh let's let's talk about us first and um, of course the lockdown still continuing in in london uh it's going to continue for further three weeks so uh yeah we you won't be able to see any kind of new outdoor videos that we usually do for quite some time until like you know almost everything's kind of calmed down uh so we can't physically go out and shoot is against the, the law. We might get fined or police might actually arrest us. Uh, we don't consider it as essential key workers. So uh, it's, it's something that we have to endure for the meantime. Uh, so unfortunately, so this is a live environment. I'm trying to get uh, uh, to do this every week and just to cut, to, to keep you guys and uh, you know informed about what's going on with the channel, of course, uh, any topics you may want to discuss and talk about, uh, that should be very, very good. And, uh, and uh, but apart from that, you know, uh, Tracy and I are both, you know, healthy. Uh, so uh, we are still working very hard in the back end. Uh, I got some parcels just uh, been delivered this morning. So I've got some new stuff to talk about. Hopefully when the lockdown's finished, I'll be able to do some review uh, video. So that will be pretty, pretty good. I, I can't wait to share all those new stuff that I really can't kind of start stacking at the back of my room now. So uh, it's, it's quite a few things I need to talk about. So. Uh, I'm getting excited, but just wait for that. So please bear with me. Okay, so that's my channel update. So uh, it's quite short updates, nothing going on, you know, as long as we are healthy, as long as you guys are healthy, that's the most important thing, right? Okay, so let's talk about today's topic, R5. Right, okay, uh, let me just close the, the topic thing down. Okay, there we go. All right, so let's take a look at this big image of the gigantic, gigantic EOS R5. You know, this is the, the latest designation. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, I want to talk about it just because it is a camera that almost reminds me of the days when I got my hands on the very, very first Canon 
EOS 5D. Um, that camera, of course, you know, one of the uh, 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 the first affordable um, uh, full frame mirrorless camera. Uh, on the market and uh, you know even though it was at the time I think it was 2000 was it 2005 I can't remember exactly but to, uh, the, I, I was one of the first ones who got the the 5D uh, uh, you know because I was a professional photographer I needed a full frame camera so I just went ahead and buy it and it was actually relatively cheap compared to the likes of uh, uh, the 1D at the time and all the other cameras that has, has full frame sensor because they were ultra expensive so for like a thousand pound or, or thereabout you know it was relatively cheap uh, plus you know I already have a lot of Canon glass you know it just makes sense to move into that system um, but it was a revolutionary but I think the true inspiring camera from Canon was the 5D Mark II because what happened was that camera single-handedly transformed the not only just photography but videography and filmmaking and uh, it, it just uh, uh, amazing you know how that camera uh, changed everything that we do these days you know using DSLR or mirrorless cameras to film uh, uh, like contents like what we're doing right now and also photography on the side uh, so that hybrid that was kind of like the godfather of hybrid cameras and you have both video features you can utilize all the big full frame glass to do cinema cinematic shots and things like that so it, it was cool but then after the 5d mark ii and quite frankly you know even though i was a canon guy i was frustrated and also disappointed about almost the lack of development in the uh, in the canon world you know like the subsequent 5d mark iii then the mark IV, and uh, it it just wasn't quite there to be frank and then uh, the mark III essentially you know you have a little bit of af boost you know it's, yeah has more focusing point but the image quality department is almost identical to the mark ii so like then the mark IV came about you know oh you add a dual uh, dual focusing dual af focus and then it has better af uh, uh, again and also image quality is improved but then the, the video features is almost like like you know like restricted just because canon didn't want to cannibalize their cinema line which is a c c100 c200 lines you know they don't want to cam kind of cannibalize that kind of market so they deliberately hold back on the video features so that, that i think that was kind of like one of the reasons that really drove me out of canon you know because they there was just a lack of development there and then um, when the R system came a couple of years ago, the first R, uh, I'll, I'll kind of remember what the number is now, they got RP as well, the EOS R, the RP, and now the R5. So the R5 on paper, at least, this is what we'll talk about today. So the, the, uh, the R5 technically on paper is amazing. And it's almost as inspiring as the original 5D Mark II uh, because it has, it's doing something that nobody, nobody else can do at this moment in time, especially at that price point. And I'm talking about price point because yeah, you can get all the features in cameras, uh, but they, are, they would cost at least 10 times more the money. So, uh, uh, so we, at the, obviously we don't know exact cost at the moment, but speculating the cost is gonna be around about $10,000 US dollars, uh, or around about 10,000 pounds for that particular camera. But considering what, what sort of specs that it has in that camera, like uh, uh, 4K, 180 frame per second, 120 frame per second 4K, and shooting 8K raw, 25 and 30 frame per second. And um, uh, these are, you know, quite something, you know, and then uh, uh, in terms of technologically, you know, this is, this is a step up, you know, and from what we've seen for the last decade almost. Um, I know that, you know, there are developments like uh, uh, the Sharp uh, last year, they announced and also had the prototype using the Micro Four Third sensor, producing an 8K dedicated video cameras. Uh, but so far we haven't seen a production model and um, we haven't seen the actual final specs of that camera. Um, even though we know that it's using a micro four third mount, using a micro four third sensor, it's made by a renowned uh, a company in Japan, Sharp. Uh, so it's interesting. But the thing is, they didn't really push further. We haven't so far really haven't seen a working prototype yet. And uh, I, I will. I'll be eager to see a Micro Four Third Sense in 8K, uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about you know the the true practicality side of it, not having an 8K camera. And um, but then the the the, uh, the the Canon is now saying that yes, they're confirming the specs, saying that they're going to have 8K raw capture, 
internal 422 and 10-bit. Uh, this is 8K I'm talking about, yeah? This is amazing, right? And then, uh, of course, it has the general 4K, whatever number of frames now. Uh, and also, I think it's gonna have ultra high speed 1080 shooting as well, which is gonna be really, really, in, really important. Um, so, uh, <laughs> David say no one is AK, right? Yeah, this is something I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna dive into it. Just, just hold on to it. I'm gonna talk about it in a minute. Yes, AK is, is something that unheard of. You know, even though I was, I can easily, easily say that uh, uh, the, around the entire globe that we're living in at the moment, I would say probably upon zero 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 one percent of the population would have an 8K compatible TV, right? So that's, that's one thing. And then, um, so it's, it's something that, uh, you know, it sounds good on paper, so it may not come as a final thing that, that people can actually enjoy. So, right, before I go into that, that side of it, let, let me continue to talk about the camera first, because I, I'm gonna have a lot to talk about the 8K stuff compared to the, what we're using now, the Micro Four Third, right? Okay, so um, so the camera, the R5, I think is a technological feast on its own, and it is really inspiring. It's really pushing the envelope, and uh, that the, I think it's a good thing. In generally, um, in general speaking, even though I'm an Olympus ambassador, as all you all know about it, um, the, of course I use and love everything about Olympus, the Micro Four Third platform, all the all the goodness that that comes with the Micro Four Third, right? But I think, to me, um, the the having some manufacturers really driving the, the, the demand and also pushing the envelope further is good, right? This is all, I'm looking as a photography industry as in general. I mean, just similarly like, like Olympus pushing the IBIS, you know, the, the, the stabilization is now being adopted basically across, across the board now. You know, every single camera manufacturer will have some degree of IBIS in, in some of the cameras lineup. So this is really, really good. And also computation photography, Olympus also has all these fantastic live composition, live boat things now being adopted slowly from Panasonic and some other companies now as well. So this is really, really kind of interesting that how uh, manufacturers, individual manufacturers really driving the innovations and, and this is always good to hear. Um, so I think, I think R5 is a very interesting camera. Just by looking at the spec, no one's held it yet. But I want to show you one photo, and, uh, and this is another reason. Actually, now I'm going to run to the end before I show that photo. So, uh, but it is an interesting uh, uh, innovation, and I, I don't know when exactly they're going to launch it, but uh, uh, as soon as it comes out, I'm pretty sure you're going to see lots and lots of people reviewing, so I don't have to even do anything about it. Uh, I'll be curious to see all the footage. Right, now let's go into what we are going to talk about today uh, as a bit more detail now. Do you need 8K. So I really see people already uh, talking a little bit about uh, 8K. We don't need 8K and things like that. Um, yes, I already mentioned possibly in the entire world population, only 0.00001% of people would have some sort of 8K compatible display that will be able to, uh, that you will be able to enjoy that footage. And majority of the uh, uh, cinema that we're seeing at the moment, they also for only about 4K and, uh, you know, just being blown up uh, because it is actually not a practical resolution for majority of us. And I'm, I'm saying from the fact that um, the good evening, <laughs> Burana, yes, it is late in your area. And uh, so I, I guess, you know, the 8K resolution isn't exactly needed but I think our, what Canon did was they just want to show people that they can do it. And one other caveat about that is um, that when you have ultra high res uh, resolution camera and the subsequent lower lower resolution like the 4K or the, the 1080 can push the envelope further. Right now because they, the Alpha can, uh, can record an 8K 24, 20, uh, 25, 30 frames per second, it means they can do higher speed in 4K and even more so in 1080. So and I don't know exactly, they haven't confirmed the exact figure, maybe they can do 1080 960 frames per second, or 4K, they already say the 4K can do 120. So that is really a first almost across the industry. And uh, so it's, it's quite quite good to have to, to see that. And uh, of course, you, whether you need it or not is another thing. And uh, like I mentioned, you know, you can't really just 
purely relying on slow-mo high resolution to rescue things. Like I talk about uh, photography many, many times, you know, uh, against high resolutions to low resolution cameras, uh, uh, whether you do need uh, uh, good lights to produce better photography or films, you know, all these elements is there. You know, you need to utilize not just one thing, but everything together to produce great work. Uh, so I, I guess ultimately, the envelope is now being pushed by Canon. So now, every, now it will be interesting to see what other people are going to see this, uh, how to interpret uh, these innovations and, and this, this boundary now is being pushed to another step. Uh, like, you know, like all the others like Panasonic who are really big in the video world, where they are, whether they are going to step up with the S2 uh, in the future, you know, uh, the next uh, the next generation of the S camera, full frame camera, we're going to be pushing to 8K. Uh, they the, and all the others like Black Magic, they have 6K red. Uh, 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 you know, I'm not talking about the professional uh, 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 stuff. You know, they are like 40, 50 thousand pound uh, machines. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the consumer level stuff, like six, seven thousand, even ten thousand uh, dollar cameras. I'm talking about these sort of like spectrum of cameras. Uh, they will be closely watching what Canon can do and then see how they're going to respond to it. Now, let's go back to Micro Four Third. Okay, so Panasonic has been quite quiet in the Micro Four Third development over the last 12 months, and uh, we haven't seen an update for their really popular GH5 series, the GH5 and GH5S. Uh, they have did the firmware update for the G9, so which means that uh, the, these, the G9 is actually, to me, a better hybrid camera than the GH5 ever was. And because GH5 is still more of a video camera compared to uh, uh, the, the G9, which is actually a photographer camera, and but now they add a firmware to make it more like a hybrid camera, pretty much what the EM1 Mark II and the Mark III now does. Uh, uh, but the thing is, we can see, it, we can see room for improvement. And um, uh, I'm not suggesting anything in this moment in time because I know Olympus is definitely working on something in the background to, uh, on the video side because uh, it, they, you know, this is a growing market and this is a fact. Everyone is now talking about video contents, uh, creators, uh, vloggers, and everybody you know, are really, really looking into motion pictures. Uh, although you know, there's still a whole bunch of uh, uh, loyal photography uh, photographers, fans, you know, who really adore the Olympus, like myself, you know, I really adore, you know, I've talked about how good Olympus was in the color science, the technologies and all the other stuff that comes with it. But I do think Olympus is actually very capable in the video side. That's why I'm, you know, producing commercial content using Olympus camera. But having said that, you know, like, uh, uh, if you are more like a dedicated videographer, most of the people would be using Panasonic because yes, they do have more options, they do have more settings, they do have more frame rate to play with. Um, that's that's a fact. But one thing that I still can't get used to Panasonic is the color signs. And uh, I know you can tweak colors in post production, but it's something that I, as a color, as a photographer who was so used to looking at really uh, natural colors, you know, skins and everything, you know, I, I really can't get past the Panasonic color, you know. Okay, this is personal preference, personal choice. I'm not saying that I'm right or you're wrong or anything like that, and or I really discussed about uh, Panasonic or, or the other camera. Um, no, um, that's, not what, um, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that I prefer Olympus cameras uh, and their colors. So uh, it, it, just, it just, I think, is really good. Uh, so now, I think it's fair to say that 4K is a generic or basic standard now across the board now, because basically your phone can do 4K videos now. And then uh, it, it's, it's interesting to see, you know, how people can utilize it. Because I can tell you right now, how many people like in the commercial world uh, uh, actually shoot or output file in 4K? Not many. And uh, I know, of course, in the filming industry, uh, in the proper production house, is very different story because they do produce 4K contents uh, for future proofing. You know, it just uh, you know the movies. You know, they never ever need to upscale it to high resolutions uh, for future formats. Uh, they will have the room to do so. They most likely will shoot a four, a 6K, for instance, and then uh, so their film will be outputting in 4K. That will, will be buying like all these UHD. Uh, movie discs and or streaming uh, platform at the moment, so they they are available to do that sort of thing. But for most of us, even at my level, you know that I produce commercial work for a lot of clients. I I would actually shoot in 4K 
and then output internality. In some cases, companies actually ask me for 720 because depending on what sort of uh, uh, platform they, they use, the videos for. Uh, a lot of them will be only doing IGTV, a lot of them will be uh, 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 posting on, uh, you know, just having a little little kind of space in the website and uh, it's all about streaming quality. So some, sometimes, you know, video contents doesn't need to be ultra high resolution, for instance, because uh, uh, they might only use it as a corner or background of the website. So they don't need ultra sharp because they will take up a lot of space, take up a lot of streaming capacity. Um, and also the website will be kind of very heavy, it's very, very difficult to process, and it will result in very sluggish performance overall. Uh, so there's a lot of things that if you're not really in the commercial world, you really can't see it. For a lot of people who are, uh, I would say, uh, at a commercial level, enthusiast level, you will would see a uh, a need to go for the high resolution because it sounds cool, right? <laughs> Even I think it's cool, you know, having high resolution stuff. Uh, it, it just similarly, you know, if you haven't tried high res mode in Olympus cameras, you try because it's it just would be mind blowing just to see all those details popping out. But in reality, how often do you need those resolution? I think that's the that's the point I'm trying to make here. Uh, the it, you know you do you print billboard size print like every day? And, um, and, but I guess, the, you know, you are, you will be the judge of it, whether you do need that sort of resolution. Um, like I, uh, four or five weeks ago, when before the, the London lockdown, and uh, I met up with a bunch of photographers uh, in London, and uh, one, of, uh, one of my friends there was using a, uh, a 42 megapixel Leica, the, the latest monochrome, which has 42 megapixel. And he was telling me exactly what I've been telling everybody. You know, he said, I really hated the 42 megapixel files because, you know, it looks good, but it takes forever to edit. And then, um, and, and I said that many times, because to, to, to edit or to actually work on a high resolution file, whether it's gonna be photography file or video files, doesn't really matter. You do need a powerful backend to support it. So there's no point just having a camera that can do all everything. Having the, the biggest, fastest memory card to do everything, but then ultimately you have to offload those files from your memory card to your computer to edit. And uh, so, you know, if, you're, if your computer is not powerful enough, you won't be able to take benefit whatsoever to see anything. And also, like I mentioned, you know, like if you do shoot at 8K, uh, you are not going to see the difference on a 4K TV, for instance. Yes, I understand, you know, like a down sampling, you know, if you're having an 8K file, when you output it onto a 4K or 1080, you will look sharper. Yes, I agree, that's, that's totally true. But I think at this moment in time, because of the resolutions, that restriction on uh, what we have at the moment, like even if you've got the top of the line 4K screen, you will not actually see that much of a difference between 8K down sampling to 4K. Uh, 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 you will see a difference from 1080 boosted up to 4K, that's for sure. Uh, or you have a 1080 screen, you have a 4K camera and down, downscaling it to 1080 output, you will see the, the, the difference and you will see it's sharper, for sure. Uh, but I think, the, like I mentioned many times now, there are many things that's good about 4K. It's made basically, at this moment, it's pushing the envelope. But on, on the practical side, no, I don't think you are going to get benefit from it. I don't think many people will get benefit from it, especially those who think it might be cool, but just don't have the, the back end to accompany your, your edits or anything that you want to achieve. Um, even like I have the top of the range Mac at the moment, and then uh, it's, still, it's still not going to be easy for me to edit anything uh, over, uh, over 4K, because once you're having a, a few LUTs going on, once you have a, a few effects going on, um, like you know, have 20 different layers on, you are not, you will find that your computer will actually struggle to process by the time you're adding all these layers. Um, uh, that is basically what I'm trying to say, you know, like when you have an 8K, you know, you, if you want to process it, you know, you do need everything. So, hope you guys get my point, um, but I'm not saying that it's wrong. I I'm, I'm actually do admire Canon who, who are able to push the envelope. Uh, and also, the, I think I heard about something about Canon R5 is that it's also fanless, which means that it's, I don't know, so, so far, nobody actually know how it does it. But then, um, because when you have that sort of resolution pumping into it, it tends to overheat. And that's why you see uh, the S1H from Panasonic, uh, the dedicated video camera has a fan uh, within the bodies to keep it cool. Because when you have high resolution, high speed cameras, uh, uh, it generates a lot of heat and not 
a normal camera body can actually handle uh, and also uh, let alone sitting in bright sunny day and uh, you might actually overheat uh, that's one of the problems that a lot of the Sony cameras encounter before unless you're going for the dedicated video cameras uh, overheating is one of the issues in video terms because when you shoot the longer you generally heat and that's why I still use the M1X and M1 Mark III to, to do shooting because it uh, it acts a very very good heat management there and especially while uh, the M1X has a heat sink behind the sensor So it's actually pretty cool there. Anyway, so uh, I had I hope I talk a little bit about the R5. Well, I'm getting excited about it But I'm not gonna get it and uh, not I'm not gonna switch under someone someone that was saying that uh, am I switching back to Canon? No, I'm not switching back because of this reason Right <laughs> okay, you see this and uh, right, it's mass massive lens and this is exactly I think one of the reasons that drove me out of the full frame world is uh, is this it's the size you know like okay it has a mirrorless body that may be the same size as the the M1 Mark II or the M1X but look, just look at that lens you know like right. This is 85 1.2. I'm not saying it's the same light for light, but like this is a 45 1.8. I mean, even the 45 1.2, which I have in my bag there, uh, is, is this size. And then the 85 1.4 there, or 1.2 here, is double the size of this and weights double. And uh, I've been there, you know, like the lenses are big. And if you put it into backpack, okay, even though this body might be a little bit smaller, but they, if you pack everything with all the lenses that you require for a job, for instance, you will still end up with a relatively big and heavy case. And uh, this is something that I am really sick and tired of, you know, after 15 years being a Canon guy. And uh, with all due respect, you know, I love Canon, you know, I love everybody, you know, who are in the industry, in, in the photography industry. We, we still, I wouldn't say I hate each other, you know, like, I mean, I'm not doing fanboy talks, you know, I do, I, you know, Olympus is the best, I mean, I like Olympus, of course, I prefer to use it, but that's my preference, but I wouldn't discuss all the other brands as well, you know, they, they're all great companies, they all have histories, they're all pushing the further, uh, pushing the for further for everyone to enjoy, um, that we are all in the same boat, right? I mean, we're all a photographer, a filmmaker, we're all content creator, creatives, so we all like ev what everybody else is doing at the moment. Ultimately, it's the contents that matters, right? You know, the, the photographer, the photos that you, you produce, uh, if you're a great photograph, they are great photograph. I don't really care what's, what's captured behind it. I mean, who, what, what sort of camera you capture with. Um, you know, I, 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 like, I like photographer. You know, I like photography, I like filmmaking, I like to enjoy the content that I see, you know, in front of me in, in, on the computer screen. So, um, uh, so ultimately, I think this is what I want to say today in this R5 discussion. But let's, let's read some of your comments and see whether I can answer some of the stuff and whether some of them are interesting. <laughs> uh, give me a second, I'm going to roll through some of the comments here to see actually some of you guys have been talking about. <laughs> Right, I'm gonna start up with this, and uh, so Jira, you're you're thinking the R5 is gonna be expensive. Yes, it's gonna be expensive. It's not gonna be cheap because it's considered as the high-end uh, Canon um, mirrors camera. So it's gonna be, I think, rumors really saying about ten thousand dollars US dollars a camera. So in the UK, at the moment, everything we're getting in the UK is one to one. So like whatever dollar it is, it's gonna be whatever numbers in pounds. Yeah. So ten thousand dollars would be ten thousand pounds. So I guess the this is how much the R5 is going to cost, uh, but this is based on whatever I see on the internet. So I have no idea, but I think it, I wouldn't be unfair to say it would be that sort of money because an 8K video camera is something that is not aiming for the normal people. It's aiming for people who are already producing commercial work. Uh, has the firepower at the back, like I mentioned, you have to have supercomputer to process all this file. So they yeah they're definitely aiming for that type of people, not the generic uh, uh, content creators. So let's see, and uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> say something about except <laughs> what do you mean? I always say something. I mean, I even have a Leica camera right in front of me here, <laughs> Ricky. And uh, so yeah, it's it's uh, it's interesting. It's interesting, and uh, uh, I do like to talk about stuff in general. I think photography one hundred and one, like I mentioned before, uh, is more about photography, more about uh, uh, learning about photography, inspirations, uh, things in general. I'm not 
really trying to push into Michael Forther, you know, although that I can do that uh, quite easily just because I just know how to use the system to its maximum. Um, but this is something I want to urge you to do, you know, like uh, uh, instead of switching system, thinking our oh, system, system may be better than your current system, try to learn up everything about what you have already and try to maximize what you can achieve with it before considering thinking about moving. Because, um, uh, you know, regardless, I'm not just talking about Olympus, whether you're going to be using Panasonic, using uh, a, a Sony or any other thing, doesn't really matter. You, all you need to do is to learn about it, learn about your craft, you know, just to make sure that you're going to be a competent photographer, a competent uh, a, a videographer, filmmakers. Uh, because once you learn about that, you, you will actually find that, you know, you can use anything to produce anything. And, uh, and at that point, you just find the right tool for you. And uh, uh, that that's what I want to say. So, okay, let's see what other things uh, here. <laughs> and, uh, right. No, I'm not switching. <laughs> I'm still an Olympus guy. Yes, you know, and, and I love I love everything Olymp what Olympus does. So yeah, don't worry about it. I'm switching. I'm definitely not switching. <laughs> and uh, let's see. Right, and uh, yes, no one needs 4K, I already mentioned it, and uh, quite in detail why you probably don't need 8K, uh, uh, even 4K I would say, because uh, uh, a lot of people, a lot of the YouTube content creators are actually still outputting at 1080, so in, in a lot of cases, I don't think you need 4K, but some of the argument that we discussed before, you know, having a 4K camera recording in 4K and down sampling, or uh, when you output in 1080, you will get sharper and better picture quality. Yes, that is true. So you may want to utilize that that uh, that uh, option there, or even like uh, cropping, digital cropping in, in in video. So you can do crop without losing any details. If you, especially when you move uh, when you output in 1080 mode. So like, let's say you 4K is so four times the resolution as 10, 1080. So like you are able to crop in basically a quarter of the screen, still getting the same pixel to pixel qual uh, clarity. So that's how much you can process with the higher resolution cameras. So there you go. Okay, so let's see if uh, anything else in here. <laughs> right, I don't want throw frame. I want a new sensor for Michael Forth, but not video focused um that's interesting because i think it's it's actually hand in hand now if you no matter how you look at it uh you know all the camera these days will have some degree of video features whether it's going to be more video heavy or more photography heavy that depending on what the model or the marketing people decide whether whether that camera is aiming for whatever type of customer they want to aim at and uh, but a sensor will have to nowadays will have to essentially do well in both, and uh, because unlike photography, you know, video is a live processing. You know, you need a fairly good sensor to be able to process all those data live, and and you know, like dynamic range, for instance, and and also color manipulations. You need a lot of those things. You know, that makes sure that the sensor can actually produce. Uh, a photo photography is slightly different beast altogether, but. You know, try to cut it in short, you know, they need a sensor that can do well in both these days. Now, whether it's going to be Olympus, Panasonic, Sony, everybody. But Sony sensors is, at the moment is quite renowned for both, you know, in terms of capabilities. Uh, so it'll be quite interesting to see what happened. Especially now, I think, and I read some articles uh, probably two, three weeks ago. Uh, they actually talked about the Sony actually in, um, had the Michael Fawcett sensors that is capable of producing very high quality uh, uh, dynamic range, I think, um, uh, improved by a stop to a stop and half, and also increased the, uh, the actual native resolution from 20 to 24 to 26. So that will be quite interesting. And uh, let's see. <laughs> Craig, you're, you're, you're bang on. And uh, I, I, I think that uh, this is, will be an issue, because especially now the Canon R5 is not going to be have a fan in it. And well, I don't know, this is what the rumor says, that it may have a fan, I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, shooting high resolution and high speed video camera requires a lot of heat management. And this is why that the 
EM1 X that I'm filming on right now is actually, I think it's pretty darn good video camera because the heat sink that I mentioned behind the sensor uh, would alleviate all the heating problems. And even when we were shooting with the uh, EM1 Mark II before the One X came out, uh, we shot three of these cameras on the side uh, in a bright sunny day, like harsh light, your harsh sunlight uh, wedding, rolling it continuously for about four hours. It was no problem at all. The, the camera was very hot to touch, but it was no overheating. You know, unlike some of the cameras, you know, uh, we did have a Panasonic uh, back, backup camera that we were using for another angle, and that one actually went completely after about half an hour. You just say overheating. And uh, so the Panasonic camera actually gave, it, uh, gave up, uh, but the Olympus was kept rolling. So that was quite amazing. But yeah, you do need a lot of heat, uh, heat elements then, and we'll see what happened. And uh, <laughs> 30 seconds in 8K. Well, that's another thing. And uh, we don't know what sort of file size is going to be like, you know, but you can kind of do some maps there. And uh, you, you may actually see a lot of uh, uh, faster memory cards, uh, even bigger memory card coming up because 8K is going to eat memory card like breakfast. Uh, I'm not joking, man. Like my, at the moment, like all my cards are 64 gig. But when I shoot like C4K, for instance, and uh, uh, I'm not even talking about AI yet, I'm just about normal uh, 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 compression, compressed video file. Uh, it takes up a lot of space too. In a few minutes, will feel gigabyte ready. So 64 gig doesn't actually relate to a lot of minutes. So if you've got a higher, higher bit rate cameras, and, uh, uh, or even high resolution, high bit rate, you are going to, basically 64 gig will probably be only a few minutes worth of, of footage. And that's, that's scary, that is scary. And that's what I mean about computer. You do need a huge computer system to be able to process this file. This is gonna be something, you know, and then, uh, I don't know, I don't know. We'll see, we'll see. <laughs> only, if Tanda, only if Canon delivers. Well, yeah, only if, only if, but time will tell. We'll see, we'll see, David, and uh, okay. I think so. I think so. I think this is a good comment. And then uh, I do genuinely hope that, you know, uh, that companies inspire each other, you know, by pushing the boundary further and further. And uh, I think what Olympus, Olympus does well uh, in recent years is in the improved ergonomics, the build quality, uh, the uh, the computation photography and IBIS and I think these areas are really really amazing and this is actually all the areas that a professional actually wants um, that they definitely listen to a lot of professional photographers you know and uh, before you even join the company uh, as an ambassador you know but I'm pretty sure because I can see how it developed because I I held the EM1 Mark I before before even considering Olympus and I liked the ergonomics but then I felt that the camera wasn't actually solid enough for me, I mean, that, that's me. But then when it, Mark II came out, I loved it. Uh, the, then, then when I'm the 1X that I'm using right now to film, um, the, the, the one that is even like on another level, it's definitely like something you can, you can throw it at someone and break, break a complete building, you know? It's like just amazing how well it built. So uh, it's reliable. You know, definitely, and and ultimately, like I mentioned from the last stream, uh, saying that you know reliability is one single most important factor for any professional to to choose. You know, it's one of these boxes they need to take before they're considering a tool. Uh, you don't want a camera to fail when you go out and shoot someone. You know, like. A, that's, that come all wrong. <laughs> Not shit someone. When I film someone, I photograph someone, and uh, <laughs> so this is something I guess you just need to. Uh, uh, understand and uh, most of you guys probably wouldn't even care uh, too much about the uh, on the reliability side of it but for someone like myself you know I, I really can't afford to say to my client halfway through the photo shoot or filmmaking and then I say oh sorry mate and uh, my camera just broke down we need to reboot or you know just wait a few seconds I can't say that sort of thing to my clients definitely not you know and it doesn't come across professional at all so yep not good not good Okay, let's see, and uh, <laughs> that may well be, that may well be great, and uh, <laughs> uh, really, really, David, you got some insider information there, right, okay, this game <laughs> changed their numbers to 30, well, you never know, you never know, I think that's the, uh, the, the new camera they're going to talk about, the, uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Yes, interesting, because you mentioned the 8K TV. 
yes, that could be coming. And I know that they already demoed it in, in CES, isn't it? They already talked about 8K last year uh, at CES and also this year's CES. And then, uh, actually, you know, did it happen? I can't even remember. It didn't happen, isn't it? But anyway, they talk about it last last couple of years on the 8K TV production. They actually have working prototype of the 8K TV. Uh, but just like most countries at the moment, especially in the UK, you know, like uh, uh, we can't air like, you know, over the air, I'm not talking about streaming through the wire, through the internet, uh, over the air, you can't actually air anything over 4K, 2.7K, you know, is impossible for the current wavelength at the moment. So that's the technological limit of what we can achieve with that sort of uh, uh, broadcasting uh, equipment. Uh, you can stream 8K if you really want to, but I don't think in UK or a lot of the countries in the world are capable of streaming 8K content. And the most of the, the 4K content that you see at the moment are actually not generally 4K, depending on regions, of course, uh, but a lot of the places they're actually downscaling to 2.7K without you actually realizing it. And uh, so I guess we are not, the in, in as, as a technology hub, you know, as a, a globe, we're looking at thing in gen, things in general, we're not quite ready for 8K broadcasting and streaming services because they, they, there's no infrastructure for it yet. You may have an 8K TV, but you won't be able to take advantage of it. Just like the early days of 4K, you know, similarly. Okay, and uh, let's go through here. Leon, and uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not entirely sure. I think, I think Leon, I think Nikon has been, been really, really um, trying. You know, the, the Z series have been relatively successful and uh, it has some good features in it. The AF is pretty good. The video files are pretty pretty nice and uh, it still has the typical Nik Nikon colors and uh, which I can't get used to, similar to Panasonic. I and mean, I still prefer Canon colors than Nikon colors, but that's that's debatable. You know, I'm not I'm not talking about fanboy talk, so I should shut up now. <laughs> but I think I think Nikon's are doing well. I, I I do hope that Nikon will succeed, you know, in one way or the other in the, in in the photography world. Just keep them going, you know. I I really hate to see anybody collapses, you know, and uh, in tough environments. Uh, just like when we lost uh, Minotas, uh, obviously subsequently changed to Sony. Uh, when we lost Minota, I was hard, hard was heartbroken, you know. And uh, similarly in our Pentax, you know, I I really don't see Pentax going. You know, like I, I, I had Pentax, Pentax film SLRs, you know, and uh, they were great cameras. I hate to see companies with history, with fantastic, uh, uh, you know, his, uh, uh, like photography journeys just suddenly disappear. You know, I don't like that. Minota, you know, it's, it's a really good company. And, and, uh, but I, I was sad to, to see it go many years ago. And... Uh... <laughs> Oh, Ricky, Ricky. Okay, let's see what other things I can see. Double size, double price. <laughs> okay, and... Uh... <laughs> For bodybuilder, yeah, man. You, you need, to be honest, you need guns to pick up that, that sort of kit. You know, if you imagine, you know, your, the, the lens is there worth about like, you know, I mean, weight's about one, one to 1.5 kilo just on the lens alone. You know, that's gonna be something. You, need, you do need some muscle. Uh, like I said, you know, like I used to have pretty fit built, you know, just to hold a camera, a camera system uh, from Canon. It, you do need a lot of strength to do that, especially if you hold it for hours at a time, you know, and uh, like weddings, for instance, uh, when I shoot weddings, I have the stand with Canon two bodies and all these big massive lenses all day, you know, for about 12, 13 hours. That, that was tiring. That kills my body. And uh... Right. Sunday vlogs, okay, you say something, I have a Lumix G80, but when I use inside the house, the video is so dark. Right, uh, okay, that's something slightly out of context here, but you know, if you're having some problem with videoing, it either means that your lens is too slow or you just haven't got enough light. That's all, you know, all you need is something like you're using at the moment, I have a key light here just to lift up the environment and you, you'll get light, so you'll be, you'll be all right. Don't push, don't try to push the ISO too much because uh, just like photography, you need light to create images. So you do need a lot of light. So if you, if you, you wherever you're shooting, it's really dark, pump some light in, you know, that's, that's a simple solution. Okay, let's see what else, and then come recent video, DP review about the video. 
Um, to be frank, I don't think I've heard anything about the uh, the audio department on the EM1 Mark III. I know that the EM1 Mark III actually has high res capture now, it's 96 kilohertz, and, uh, which is actually pretty good. Uh, I think the preamp is still not to the professional standard and hence why we always need a professional audio capturing device you know regardless we never ever rely on the preamps on the cameras you know that it's just never good enough so what i usually do of course it depends on what sort of thing you do and uh, either using a proper mic and then or yeah something you know other than using just the internal built-in mic and built-in amp um, to do things uh, you you know the lsp4 like the the one that we've been using you know you can record separate file using high res mode and uh, it's actually really really amazing how much clarity you can get from the audio the audio recorder and then you just uh, have to sync it in post that's what most the professional houses do anyway you know like uh, just because youtubers uh like myself sometimes, you know, just get feeling a bit lazy. That's why we just burn the audio into straight into the video file using the preamp in the camera. Uh, but I, I think it's overall, it's not too bad. I mean, I don't think you can tell the difference uh, that much unless you are a proper audio file, then you can analyze all the frequencies and things like that. And, but most of the time you, sh you should be fine with that. So let's go on to other questions here. It's just imagine what computer spec. <laughs> I know, I know, right? You know, and then um, it's, it is hard. You know, just, just like like I mentioned earlier, uh, my computer's already geared for 4K, but I, I already think about upgrading because it's, you know, uh, it's now that I'm getting more jobs for from videos in the commercial world, I do need to beef up a little bit my backend system just to support whatever I want to achieve. And I'm still not talking about 6K, I'm still talking about 4K stuff that I'm doing in a moment. So uh, once you get into it, you know that videos does require a lot of, power especially from the graphics department uh, departments and uh, it needs a lot of you know uh, horsepower to actually run the engines uh, to make sure that you know you can process all these massive files you, you generate and uh, it is not easy definitely not easy and uh, <laughs> yeah i mean uh, this is about wanting or actually working and uh, i guess Everybody wants the latest and the greatest, right? You know, and uh, myself included, you know, don't say that I'm not, you know, I'm a normal human being, I'm a normal guy, you know, who like just like gadgets like everybody else. And uh, sometimes it is something to crave for, you know, when you see something brand new and when you see something just revolutionary, just something, you know, just when you look up to, you just almost like the holy grail, you know, for I mean, this moment in time, you just want to grab hold of it and, and enjoy it. But then like, I kind of gave that up many years ago when I turned professional because uh, being, a, being a professional, it has a totally different agenda. You know, like, of course, you start making money from the equipment that you use and then you just have to make sure that you can use that equipment to make money. <laughs> and uh, so spending a lot of money on equipment that I potentially may not be able to utilize in max and then uh, that may not be a wise business investment. And uh, so this is a very, very different thing altogether. And, you know, okay, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be an ambassador, so I'll be able to use the latest uh, uh, Olympus gears, but I know that you probably won't need the latest camera to produce stunning works, and trust me on that, because I have years of experience, so you, you don't even need a three-year-old camera. A five-year-old camera, even 10-year-old camera can still produce stunning work, and uh, that's that's the fact. So yeah, just, just bear that in mind. I think this uh, is it's good thinking. I mean, like you said, you know, making sure you invest in new lenses, and uh, even like have uh, using your budget to travel to see the world maybe even better than getting a new body. Okay, let's see. Do you think Olympus ever put up their best AF in the EM5 and EM10 like Sony? Right. Okay. Um, well. Um, okay. Uh, I think. If you know the EM5 Mark III, it's actually already very, very good AF. Uh, I'm not too sure about EM10 yet, uh, but it depends on what sort of thing that the Olympus wants the EM10 to do, because uh, the EM10 is supposed to be a beginner level camera. So uh, uh, it's, I think the current contrast detect AF is actually good enough for photography, for most photography users. Uh, you know, if you really start to get into like uh, uh, focus tracking, the CAF and that kind of thing, or the number of burst modes, EM10 won't be that camera, you know, because it's, it's not, I mean, when a beginner pick up the camera, they're not really straight away going to track things, you know, track birds and things. It's not something 
that the market is for that camera. And uh, if you're going for the if proper bird tracking, like pro captures and stuff like that, you are probably better off using M1. And the BM5 would be kind of in between, you know, like when uh, when you're up, uh, upgrading from a beginner level to slightly intermediate, or you just want a smaller body that has most of the feature that M1 has, and uh, then the EM5 is definitely a wise choice. And, but EM5 definitely has really good AF now, and uh, especially the Mark III body is really fantastic. I'm trying to look for my EM5 Mark III, but I can't find it. <laughs> and I have a lot of camera, I, have my, I still have my Pen F here. Uh, okay, so that's that's interesting. Um, um, so we will see, we will see, and I don't think Sony um, is, uh, uh, you know, like uh, in terms of AF wise, and they still reserve the best AF on the high end camera. Uh, but what I'm interesting though, what I'm curious about is the E1X AI AF, you know, the subject tracking. At the moment, we still have three profiles, and I am really waiting to see the improved uh, uh, expanded profiles and to see what they can do with the AI tracking because uh, I'm I'm really curious I want to see because I have it I have the camera right here and the, the thing is I don't I don't really shoot uh, planes or train or cars I know those people there are plenty of those people around would utilize that feature but for me I don't shoot any of those stuff so uh, that subject tracking really doesn't work in my favor. So, I mean, I wanted like to see something else that maybe I can utilize. Uh, so that may be something to, to look forward to. Okay, let's see. And, uh, <laughs> well, that may be coming, you never know. And I know that this is kind of like the next uh, standard in slow-mo capturing now. Um, the 240 uh, uh, frame per second X-T4. In fact, you know, Sony has that Quite a, quite a while ago in the 240, uh, 240 frame in 1080 mode. Um, so Sony has always been leading in the kind of like a high speed thing there. Um, it, it really depends. And, and uh, I think when it, whenever you use high speed ca uh, capturing in any video cameras, you will find a slight softened effects, you know, in, in the actual uh, footage, uh, regardless what sort of thing. The, the, higher the, the higher speed it is, the, the lower the uh, the the lower the quality and uh, you know it's not something you're gonna watch on like let's say BBC Top Gear you know they always have this slow mo uh, a car wheels spinning and smoke and things like that they are using ultra high speed expensive professional camera and then and those are talking about like hundreds of thousands of pounds uh, hundred thousand I mean talk about not hundreds hundred thousands I'm actually talking about like big numbers they are really massive cameras dedicated to just speed capturing. And uh, but most consumer level cameras, when you're shooting at very slow speed, and uh, you will find some softening in, uh, and uh, that you cannot get away with. So depending what sort of uses, like I mentioned about, it's fun, it's cool, it's good to have some sort of insert having slow mo, but not you can't really shoot everything with slow mo, and then uh, it, it, it's kind of dis you know beside the point. Okay, but it, it's interesting. So we will see. We never know, and. Uh, uh, Hopefully Olympus will have something 240. Next, my next, my next request to Olympus is to give me 240 and 1080. That'll be good. Right. Okay. And uh, well, uh, yeah, interesting because uh, you, yeah, there are lots of sensor companies out there are producing uh, high res uh, sensors for Micro Four Third platform, but how they are going to integrate or how soon they want to integrate into the system depending on a lot of things because first of all they can they can easily throw a new sensor into into the body whether it's Panasonic or, or, or Olympus but they need their processor to be able to handle those signals and the data rate because uh, uh, at the moment the TruePic 9 is a uh, TruePic 10 is, or is it no, 7 8 Eight nine. I can't remember what was the latest one. I can't even remember. But and the the, the the latest sensor is actually very powerful. But you just you might have to wait a couple of generations before they have that sense uh, that power that that processor powerful enough to process it. Um, I know we you know we talk about chicken eggs here at the moment. You know I know other camera companies that Sony is really doing high res stuff. Um, but you can see the performance just not there. You know like for the high resolution, the slower it shoots. And uh, so all these high res cameras out there, you'll find that the uh, the continuous mode suffers, the processing time suffers, the continuous read suffers. Everything suffers because of the bigger data stream 
bigger files and everything just bigger. And uh, that's, that's why, depending on what sort of thing that Olympus or Panasonic or any other Michael Forther camera companies out there wants to, to achieve, because uh, they have to strike a balance there to make sure that ultimately, as a user, will enjoy that process. At the moment, you know, a lot of the Olympus guys, are, are, are like, you know, uh, 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 photographers, they really enjoy the performance coming out from the EM1 uh, OM, OMD cameras because of the smaller file size. And imagine you have a higher resolution and suddenly slow everything down. You can't do pro capture. Then you, you can't shoot 15, 15 frames per second with CAF. You can't do 60 frames per second. You suddenly, everything, all the numbers crunch down to like 5 frames per second, 10 frames per second because of the bigger file. And that could be a problem. So um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Time will come, but we just have to see. But like I mentioned, if even you had the 47, mega, 47 megapixel sensor files, I mean, my computer have to be upgraded to process those files effectively and quickly. And uh, I just love whatever I do at the moment. And it's perfect. I can load up all my shoots, uh, all my photos on, on Lightroom in, in, you know, I can work through all of them in a day. It's quite easy for me to do. You know, if I have a double the size of the files and everything double, I have to bigger storage. I have to almost double the time to process them. And that may not be a good thing for me. Vicky, Vicky, good afternoon. Wow, I just saw your comment. Sorry, I'm still scrolling through the comments at the moment. <laughs> okay, and uh, <laughs> oh, that's good. It's good to see Vicky. Vicky's so good. And uh, look at that. I like that. <laughs> Already obsolete. <laughs> well, to be honest, that may not be a, a bad statement at all because uh, think about what I just said about how practical having that sort of resolutions. It, it may be a moment, uh, a, mom, a momental camera, you know, and a monumental camera that it just makes everybody happy. You know, when you see the numbers and everything and the fact sheets, it, you know, just excites you, right? But how many people are gonna be able to utilize all those resolutions and all those files, whether you can process them? That's another thing. Because we're not ready. A lot of us not ready. Me, that camera, like I mentioned, is aiming for production house, slightly lower budget production house, and uh, who just can't afford a 40 grand cameras, for instance. Uh, so they will be able to make use of the 10,000 uh, 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 camera, for instance. Uh, so for that, for those people are oh, great. You know, this is good. They could utilize those. Uh, but for majority of us, yeah, you need to do a lot just to be able to use that camera. I think that's a bad thing. And, and as a photographer, as a content creator, what you want is to enjoy that process, right? They enjoy making photographs, making videos, and to create work that you can put it on the screen, just laugh at it, just laugh about it, put a smile on your face, to just enjoy the process, not having to scratch your head. God, man, this thing's so slow. Oh, oh, no, no, I'm losing, I'm dropping frames now, I can't edit. Oh, I can't see anything. And, you know, when you click the export button, you say, you say three days to render. That's not good. <laughs> you need everything. You need the whole complete package, not just buying a camera. You need everything to come with it. You know, like if you're set up for whatever you're doing at the moment, if you jump to a next level stuff, it's going to be hard. And um, like I mentioned, learn your craft is more important than anything else. You know, master your skills, make sure you can produce great work with whatever you got at the moment is way more important than getting the latest and the greatest. I keep saying that in my Photography 101. You should get it by now. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, cool. Low light photography reliance lens aperture only. <clears throat> right. You need to go back to our Photography 101 and talk about exposure triangles because Exposure is all about these things about shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. And then, uh, so you need all these things to work together for low light photography. Larger aperture is only one element to control the exposure. So you need to understand the relationship between them. You, because even you have a slower or smaller aperture, you can lengthen the, the shutter speed, you know, I mean, slowing the shutter speed, that's what I'm saying, you know, to expose it correctly. Or you can push the ISO up, depending on what sort of situation you're in. And uh, so it really, really depends. Because uh, uh, 
larger aperture also come with the the problem of shallow depth of field depending on whether what sort of thing you're shooting in low light if you want everything in focus you will have to stop down so you just have to see what sort of thing you want to apply your low light photography with uh, so it, it you know it's it's not just one thing you have to man remember it's going to be multiple elements there so like i mentioned the exposure triangle iso shutter speed and aperture okay right oh my coffee's getting cold all right let's see okay we got another one i think em1 mark 3 was good enough i have a 7 to 14 on an a7 r4 and just sell it mm. yeah 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 i agree i agree I like it, <laughs> not because I'm an Olympus ambassador, just because, um, uh, you know, I have friends who use A7R4, I have friends who use uh, the 5D SR, and then uh, it's just out, just high, like, high resolution stuff. I have people who has up like 80 meg uh, uh, files. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, yeah, I, I think... Like I mentioned, it's a process, right? You know, you gotta enjoy what you're doing. You gotta enjoy as a photographer. You gotta enjoy as a filmmaker. You know, at the moment, I'm quite happy, quite just, you know, just shooting around like this, and uh, producing whatever I need to produce. And and ultimately, as a professional, um, my clients like my work. I like my work. That's what matters, right? And uh, of course, you know, time will come when everything's ready, when they're ready to upscale it to another like resolutions but like i mentioned majority of my clients ask for a 1080 uh, resolution so they're not even asking me for 4k even though i shot uh, i shot everything in 4k but they're still asking for 1080 uh, or 720 even imagine that 720 still and uh, so it is it's weird days <laughs> uh yeah now sorry that i'm just uh, having a to see what other things on here uh, <laughs> well, one thing I do know about 8K TV is that, you know, and uh, if you do so happen to have 8K TV in the future, uh, I think all of a sudden you will see that all your favorite actresses and actors are was, look quite a few years older than they, they, that you might actually think they were. Uh, just because you will starting to see all the defects and everything on the skin, <laughs> that's for sure. And uh, I, I will probably look instantly look like sixty year old instead of like whatever I am at the moment. Have a guess why? How old I am? <laughs> okay, Victor, I'm missing the, of the background with your kiss leak. <laughs> You're really missing them. You know the reason I'm sitting right here just to avoid them, like going behind me <laughs> and uh yeah yeah they, they are fun at the moment like, i'm trying to keep them quiet instead of uh uh, uh people complaining about my video a bit no too noisy so uh, they're watching tv just a little bit quieter in the corner <laughs> okay um yeah um Yes, I know, I know what you're saying, you know, Japan government may rescue them or one way or the other, but you can't, you can't kind, you can't kind, uh, you know, not worry about some of the brands because they have been struggling for quite some time. Uh, the likes of Pentex, for instance, and, and to, to a certain extent, Nikon, um, you know, Nikon's still big, but, you know, all the cost reductions, all the cost cutting, um, uh, uh, not only in the camera lined up, but also the, the products uh, lined up. They have cut a lot of stuff. You know, Nikon has been through quite a tough few years. And uh, I, I really hope that they will, they will ride through this, you know, with success. Because, uh, uh, you know, like I mentioned, I don't want to see any, any company just go like this. And, uh, it's, it's heartbreaking to see, especially if you are a photographer or filmmakers who are genuinely, you know, love this industry and love this career. Uh, you really don't want to see any of these brand goes. You know, it is heartbreaking. And uh, like when uh, I know Vicky just said about like what I just said. You know, like Minota became Sony because Sony just took over, right? But we lost a brand. We lost the Minota brand. You know, I love that brand. It's just cool, right? I still have a couple of Minota cameras lying around, and they are fantastic cameras. Um, the, and Pentax is, you know, they they kind of like feeding some. You know, they 
uh, I don't know. I don't know how to explain. You no, know, Pentec is it's been on the edge for quite some time now, and uh, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. So I don't know what happened after the pandemic, and uh, hopefully things will go better, and maybe they have some sort of killer products to rescue them. And uh, we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Uh, to see the DVB 4K and 8K screen, you will need a very large screen. And yes. Well, that's Peter. That's that, that's cool. That fine you bringing it up because just like photography, right? If you print big, and uh, yes, a higher resolution file will enable you to print big and in higher quality in terms of sharpness. Uh, you can will be able to walk closer to see all the details. But that's the thing. When you're having a large print, same thing to videos. When you have a large screen, you're not supposed to go up close to watch it. You're supposed to stand really far back. You know, that's the whole point. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's something that I'm, you know, making sure you understand that because uh, you're not really supposed to just really inspect the pixels. You're not supposed to inspect, you know, like the, the screen, you know, in actual, the actual dot itself, where, uh, even when it has 8K. So that you do need a, uh, 8K, you do need a big screen like, to, to appreciate it. I think. 4K at the moment, I think, is a very good balance in, uh, in terms of size-wise. I mean, how many uh, people's home can afford to have like an 80 to 100 inch screen? You know, in that sort of sizes, yes, 8K would definitely benefit. But then like, not many people have that sort of space for it. So like, uh, 4K is, I think, is okay. It's, it's good enough because, you know, we sit back on the sofa, we watch 4K TV, it's sharp enough. And then, um, so I think 4K is going to be here for a good, good while. You know, even though 8K might be coming, but they're really aiming for a much, much larger screen and large, uh, a, a different type of clients altogether. So let's see what other things is there. And uh, <laughs> um, right, Victor has a a point. What's that? Does an planet Olympus plan to use? Oh well, I don't know. To be honest, and uh, uh, I'll let you know if I do know something. But uh, you know, it's going to be hard to see what sort of sensor they will adopt in the future. Um, there are several other technologies now, so we just have to wait and see what was the next step. Uh, you know, if you're judging by the current product cycle that they introduce now, so every two years they're going to bring a new camera. So uh, you, we may see a bump in resolutions and maybe a dynamic range. Uh, in the next EM1X, so that would be probably next year or the year after. So we just have to see what happens. So it will be interesting to see. <laughs> uh, right, let's so see. Right, Vicky always wants a nice lens. She always wants a nice lens, I know that. <laughs> but as a photographer, you know, always a lens is like the, the eye to everything, right? You know, like, uh, the, because I mean, I, I know it, it comes with the sensor's uh, uh, ability to resolve the, the lens details, but then a nice lens is always, you know, good, you know, in my opinion, because you do need a good lens to go with the camera, and especially when you want to produce great work. So that's that's what, you know, some, some of us were talking about earlier and, uh, you know, always invest in a better lens than a body. That's, that's for sure. That's a wise words. Um, okay. Um, Okay, Alex asks, um, would it worth the price to purchase the 12 to 100 f4 for video? Uh, that depends where, what sort of thing you want to shoot. Uh, I think it's a very, very cool video lens, only because it has uh, the stabilization built into the lens. So you will be able to take full advantage of the Sync IS that's currently on offer, the EM1X, EM1 Mark III, and EM5 Mark III. Uh, you can increase the f-stop to, you know, for another one stop, basically. So you can get seven up to 7.5 stop of stabilization. Um, we tried that, we reviewed this lens, and you can go back to check our video. Uh, it's super, super stable, you know, when you use this lens in conjunction with the Olympus body. Uh, it's really good stuff, but because it's f4, and uh, it may not be the low light, uh, 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 lens choice for me because uh, a lot of my my lower light shot even if I bring in lights for instance like this one that right now I will still use a 2.8 minimum 
lens. So, uh, uh, so it's a give or take, you know, depending on what sort of thing you use. Uh, I wouldn't say this will be the only lens for video. I will probably have another 2.8 version. So like the 12 to 40 2.8. Uh, but this is definitely a good lens, especially for the reach, because you can do a lot with that reach, and uh, which is a, a good choice. Right, um, okay. Hi. <laughs> and, uh, great stuff, Dicky. Hey, Dicky, how are you? No problem. You just watch another live session about Cityscape in Indonesia. Yeah, cool. All right, awesome. I think I saw that post, and uh, of course, I'm doing one, so I'm, I won't be able to join. That's really awesome. So, did you learn anything from the Cityscape stuff? It's quite fun, isn't it? I love Cityscape. If I have the time, I go to somewhere with a high vantage point. That's always good to see. Um, does the white kind Olympus make the settings fully configurable? Well, David asked a question. I'm not entirely certain about the question. And uh, it, they are quite configurable already, especially customization, but I'm not entirely sure. So maybe I'll come back to it later. Okay. And uh, for faster action. Yes, it is. Uh, that's that's mo most of the companies do when they do faster stuff. They'll drop the resolution or do a crop. And uh, that, I mean, that that is why they sometimes when you shoot higher speed, they will have to have a crop in, in the video just to, because they have to limit the data stream. And that's probably how much the processor is capable of processing the data in real time. And don't forget, video is different to photography. Everything has to be real time processing. And, and that takes a big toll in the actual thing itself. Um, similarly, if you use, even if you use external recorder on the, on the, on the camera, um, the, you know, you see the external uh, monitor only has a certain speed when it comes to uh, uh, recording uh, raw footage. You know, it's down to the processor. You know, if the process is just not fast enough, it won't be able to do it. And, then, uh, and, and also drains a lot of battery as well, let alone overheating. So yeah, it's a lot of things going on there. In the video, it's just not that simple. So I think needs an upgrade. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, perhaps. I mean, I, 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 I think you may have a point, but then, then again, you know, I just have to go back to what I said about what this camera is aiming at. Um, but we never know. Uh, the Mark IV may be around the corner, so we may see an AF bump, you know, uh, just like the EM5. But then they want to, they don't want to confuse the, the, the line between the EM10 and the EM5 because EM5 is already basically an EM10, but this is upgraded in the AF department. So if they upgrade AF, the EM10 will become the EM5. So uh, I'm not entirely sure how that would work out. So we, we will see, we will see. But no, you can't tell when people are using phone, you know, like in such a pure image quality, you really cannot compare a phone to, to, an, uh, to a proper camera. You know, I know there is argument, there is demonstrations, there, is, there are tests, you know, depending on the, what sort of camera you use and what sort of lighting angle, especially what you're using it for, whether you're using it for social media only or whether you're going to use, uh, 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 you know, just Instagram, for instance, then phone may be sufficient. But for people who are going to hold an EM10 for photography or, or other things, they'll be more enthusiastic about the whole process of creating images rather than just, you know, holding a phone and, and just, just snap it. You know, very, very different thing altogether. So we, we just have to see. We just have to see. Um, the PS AI software, let's open. Hmm, okay. <laughs> yep, 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 cool. Right, let's see. <laughs> you keep asking, I keep asking them too, you know, about Pen F2. Who doesn't want a Pen F2, right? Who doesn't? I love my Pen F, you know, is this... Right, if you guys have been watching my stream, I don't know how many times I said I love the Pen F. It's a fantastic camera. I love this bit. I love this, I love this camera. And then, uh, yes, if you Mark II come out, it will be like a no hesitation purchase, you know, it basically just, I will just go straight into it. Yes, I want one right now. Woo! Imagine having that EM5 Mark III spec in the EM, on a Pen F body. That would make my day. <laughs> yes. And uh, Victor, I have randomly blur images on my 42 body at the end and open aperture on the video. But even I don't expect light. Mm. Nope, I 
don't see blur images. Uh, I don't know. I have no idea what happened there. Um, you have to perhaps send me your picture. Maybe I can have a look at it to see what likely to cost it. Uh, I've used this lens a lot, and I mean a lot, uh, on my both the E1 Mark II, Mark III, and the E1 X bodies. Uh, no problem, no problem. Whatever range I shoot, 150, I shot it a lot at 2.8. Uh, I always get sharp results. If you continue getting blur results, and uh, it's maybe worth checking with Olympus uh, just to see what whether there could be potentially a fault there. But um, yeah, it's something weird going on. I'm not entirely sure until I see the image that I'll be able to tell you. Um, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, <laughs> Leon. Yes, because I, you know, like it's hard, you know, I realized in the last few streams that I was doing, and uh, I was, uh, uh, you know, getting a little bit distracted with the kids screaming in the back. So that's why I want to wear headphones so I can kind of isolate myself from, from the outside world where I can now fully concentrate on talking to you guys and uh, just easier that way. Uh, so yeah, that, that's why I'm wearing headphones. <laughs> oh, Vicky's going. Okay, bye, uh, Vicky, and uh, we'll so see you next time. Thank you. <laughs> Going coffee is calling, yes. I have one here. Excellent, cool. Well, I'm nearly catching to the end now, that's good. So I have an EP5 pen, wow, you've got a whole collection. Absolutely, <laughs> let's look at that connection. But what I love, however, is photography. There you go, there you go. That's the essence of photography, right? Is the love about doing what you love, you know, capturing that stunning image that you want to capture and then process it according to make, create a masterpiece out of it. That's what's important. Whatever makes you happy, you know. But like, like I mentioned, you know, like, uh, I know photography can be just too generic, too general, you know, like you can talk about creating masterpieces, uh, but if you have the budget, you know, go and spend it, whatever makes you happy, buying the latest camera. I'm not stopping you guys. So even though, what, despite what I said earlier, but you know, if you really enjoy that buying process, you know, uh, you know, if you've got a budget, no problem. You know, like that was makes you happy. And you can send me your camera that test, even though I can't afford it, right? <laughs> uh, okay. Right, do you have any insight uh, you're not allowed to share about, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about the the big massive beast uh, that that white lens and uh, that particular thing? I it's definitely coming out this year. Um, the I to be honest, I have seen the prototype only, and uh, I wasn't even allowed to touch it uh, at this moment. I think it's only a handful of uh, Olympus people has seen and touched, uh, let alone using it. I think there's only a specific tester. Uh, in uh, in Olympus in Japan are able to use it at the moment and uh, so nope I don't have any insight at all uh, I would love to share with you but I already pushing Olympus and saying that I would like to have a copy for review so please stay tuned remember subscribe to our channel put in the bell notification so you know that when that lens comes to my hand I will do a review video on it and uh, it's gonna be really rare it's gonna be ultra ultra uh, in demand because it's, uh, it's not going to be a high volume production uh, according to Olympus. Um, it's going to be really, really limited. So uh, yeah, even I may have to wait for it to, to see uh, to see it. So just have to bear with me. But if since I get one, I will review it. So yeah, just stay tuned for that one. But I'm, I'm interested in it. I'm curious about it. Okay. <laughs> how about how about Pen F2 with EM1 Mark III? functions <laughs> wouldn't that be great of course it would be great right um but don't forget uh there are lots of things going on you know with uh with olympus uh it's the body size it, even though it may not look it but if you actually put it side by side compared to panasonic camera olympus camera bodies are actually slimmer and smaller compared to panasonic that means if i can put it correctly you know olympus are actually the smallest micro fourth system you can get and um, uh, it is they pack a lot in there. There are not many gaps actually inside the body. Um, that is why the the M5 Mark III is 
uh, it's a fantastic camera, you know, to be able to squeeze all those technology into that slim body. Uh, similarly, you know, if you look at the Pen F body, it's exactly the same um, kind of depth compared to the, uh, uh, the EM5 Mark III. So I think at best, they will be able to squeeze is the EM5 Mark III capabilities into Pen F body. At least at this moment in time, but you never know if it does come out in two years later, technology may have evolves, uh, so we may get better stuff, right? So we just have to see. David asked, David asked, have I ever shoot 4K in YouTube? All our videos are in 4K. Yes, we shot everything in our YouTube in 4K. Apart from this stream at the moment, I can only do 1080. <laughs> and uh, but yes, everything that we do is in 4K. So uh, there you go. What's the resolving power of Olympus lens? Ooh, interesting thing you're talking about here. Um, quite frankly, I don't have scientific figures. Uh, I don't think anyone has done a test on it because at the moment, micro four thirds sensor tops at 20 megapixels. So uh, there is limited tests you can do to determine the resolving power of the Olympus uh, 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 lenses. Um, all I can say is that all the pro lenses are now capable of doing the 20 megapixels. And if you're even looking at the, the high res mode, they are easily can achieve that. So that means that they, are, they should be able to out resolve what the camera sensor can currently produce. Um, so, but exact figure, I would not know. Um, but the lower end, the kit lenses, I think they are more or less at the maximum of the whatever 16, 20 megapixels at the moment. So if they ever going to increase the, the resolutions, they may have to upgrade the lower level lenses. So that's all I can say about it. But the pro lenses are definitely have some degree of future proofness. So you, if you do invest in pro lenses, uh, you are very certain that you can still use them even if they bump up the resolutions in the futures. So Michael, um, can you name any working sports talk using Olympus? Uh, I'm not in that field, so I'm not entirely sure the name, so in, in more specific terms. I know there are quite a few uh, Japanese to uh, photographers are actually using the Olympus for shooting sports. Uh, there are some US, in the US as well. I actually spoke to a couple of guys uh, the other day. They, they, I forgot their names actually. They were... They work for the local uh, uh, newspaper who's shooting sports events, so they are actually using Olympus stuff. Uh, yeah, there, there are people using it, but I'm not entirely sure because I'm not really in that field, to be honest. But likewise, you know, like uh, the in the sports arena, they are actually more populated still with the old boys, like the Canon and Nikon boys. They are still dominating the sports arena. Not even Sony or, or Fuji, none of them are there. Uh, they, they are just, you know, using whatever they have. Because uh, a lot of the sports photographers, they are more commissioned journalists from magazines and stuff. They are company gear, so they're not really their own gear. So there's a lot of these people, they won't have the choice of what sort of camera they use. Uh, they've just been given whatever they have, so. Okay, let's see. Uh, I do MP, hmm. <laughs> right, okay, um, that's an interesting thing to say about this though um what's the ideal megapixel hmm well what do you guys think i'm not entirely sure whether it's going to be 24 26 i i think optimal would be about 24 25 that kind of resolutions i mean i, I don't want to work with larger files uh that's me you know like uh, as a professional until the point when we need it, but at the moment I don't see it happening at all. Uh, even though high resolution uh, uh, cameras are being more common everywhere. But like I mentioned, how much do you need to produce your work? You know, for let's say wedding albums, for larger prints, all you need is like 20 something megapixel, and that's more than enough to produce large prints already. So even if you have a larger, uh, uh, higher megapixel files, you probably won't be able to get any benefit from it. So, um, we, we just have to we just have to see I, I, don't, I don't know and diffraction that's another thing I don't think um, diffraction will come around 5.6 at all you know like it, lens is a lens you know diffraction usually kicks in around about 11 ish and and beyond that uh, anything be you know below 11 should still be okay so I don't think it, it works to that that sort of level so 
<laughs> it's the 75mm 1.8, the most beautiful lens ever. Right, okay. Uh, I like that lens, uh, but it's not my lens because uh, it, I think the focal length is just a little bit too long for me. It's beautiful. It's stunning. You know, uh, uh, it, check my review on that lens. Uh, I photographed with Charlie, uh, use her as my model. Uh, it's really stunningly sharp. And also the bokeh coming out from it is really creamy, very nice, very modern. And uh, I like that look of it. Uh, but for me, I would prefer the 45 1.2 Pro lens. And uh, But that's just me. But yeah, 75 is a beautiful lens. Uh, was it ever? That's subjective. <laughs> so if you like that lens, you know, by all means, that would be your favorite lens ever, or the most beautiful lens ever. And, uh, but I, I guess it's, it's okay. I like, I like, I like lenses in general. I mean, they're good lens, they are good lens. Um, but for me, like, uh, for instance, the, my, one of my most used lenses and one of my favorite lenses would be the 17 millimeters 1.2. That, that is just because I use it so much and it's one of my go-to lenses for anything. So that, that will be my, my most beautiful lens ever. <laughs> All right. Oh yeah, Kelly Cox. Yes, I remember. Yes, she is a professional. Yes, that's right. Yes, I know Kelly Cox. Yes, yes. I totally forgot about her. Yes. And uh, well done. Well done. Very, very well done. Thanks, Peter. And uh, it is a unique lens. Yes, the 75 is definitely, definitely. Excellent. Uh, right, let's see what else in here. And Ricky said that <laughs> diffraction and 61 megapixel starts at 11. I think regardless what resolution, what sort of camera you use, diffraction usually starts around about 11 anyway. So uh, that's that's for sure. Yeah, Mike, of course, Mike is shooting Motorspot. Of course, he's my counterpart. You know, I met him uh, enough times and you know, we have beers together. <laughs> and yes, now you mention it. Why don't I know about sports photographers? I do know sports photographers, especially in the, within the Olympus camp. How dare me do that? <laughs> How dare me? Right, okay. I think I caught up with all the, um, all the comments now. That's pretty good. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. And then uh, really, really good. So is there any other question you can ask me? I'm going to give you about five minutes time to ask me anything. And don't forget that in live stream, I do have a one minute delay for seeing comments. So, uh, so that's why I'm going to give you a few more minutes just to make sure you have any last questions you want to ask me, then I will be able to uh, answer them. Uh, hopefully so uh, we'll see that so yeah did you guys enjoy today's stream i think we had a quite a fun chat about the canon r5 the high resolution versus uh you know lower resolution stuff the practicality of using a high resolution cameras compared to lower resolution especially in video terms that's because we are really mainly talking about videos today and uh, but we can talk about photography later uh, that's for sure and um, uh, but like i mentioned this photography 101 is all about photography uh, if you want to learn more and improve your game uh yeah i'm here to help you you know i've been in the industry for long enough to to tell you all about photography uh, in look at your photograph for instance i can do critique sessions if you really want uh, leave some comment down below and uh after these sessions you can leave some comment uh, suggesting things that you may want to see want to talk about in terms of photography not necessarily olympus bias but let me know about everything that you would like to learn about uh, uh how to improve your 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 you know your game in photography and filmmaking i'll be able to help you uh so that would be cool right and uh <laughs> no problem um john john first time seeing you on live stream <laughs> oh no worry no worry you will be able to catch up uh, the the whole the whole thing after this been uploaded uh so I'm, I'm sure you won't you will like it it's quite fun today um yeah we i'm here every wednesday now for doing a live stream and uh, so you will be able to catch me at 3 p.m. GMT London time. So we have, we'll talk about all things photography and filmmaking, not necessarily for uh, Olympus, uh, even though I'm an ambassador, but uh, you know, I just want to talk about things that I love the most is photography and filmmaking, right? So uh, let's talk about all that stuff that, that inspired you and I go and do something with the camera. So that's, that's, that's the most important things. But at this moment in time, Everybody just stay home and, you know, just be, uh, just make sure that you stay healthy so we can go on to the next adventure together, right? So if I ever going to come out of this coronavirus pandemic things, you know, uh, I will start to organize some live events. So if you guys want to join me in London doing photo walk, you can see me live and you can talk about photography, walk with me on the street and do all kinds of photography stuff. Uh, yeah, let's do something together. Yeah, is that a deal? 
that would be good, right? Okay, cool. So yeah, if you ever want to uh, 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 ask me about photography stuff, do critique session, like anything at all, leave some comment down below. Uh, I will be able to uh, read them and take some of the notes and then we'll adjust my contents in the future weeks to come. So uh, hopefully that will be really cool. Oh, some crate just got a question. Let me just see if that one works here. <laughs> yes, but hit that like button. Yes, hit the like button, subscribe. And also don't forget that I have a, a buy me coffee link. Buy me some coffee if you want. <laughs> uh, much appreciated. And, and I do have to thank uh, a lot of you guys that has already bought me coffee. So like, I really appreciate it, especially in this sort of difficult time. Any support is much appreciated. Uh, so that's really, really awesome for you guys to do that. So thank you again. And uh, really awesome. So let's see, Craig. And uh, you have one question here. Do the Olympus Starry Sky image they show require a lot of post processing? Um, not necessarily. Well, all the night photography requires some degree of post processing to bring up those skies and the stars and things like that. So you will need some processing. I don't think the in camera uh, uh, process will be able to maximize the effect that you want to see especially in like let's say if you want to shoot the milky way or things like that uh you will need to post processing and do a little bit of dodge and burns here to just highlight something uh the details especially of the stars uh so you will need to do that uh yeah i wouldn't purely rely on in camera processing so yeah it's better to shoot raw and then just process it in po uh, in whatever program that you so happen to use so that's good so good okay Awesome, guys. No problem. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, John. Thank you, David. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining me. And uh, uh, so hopefully you uh, you guys will remember that every Wednesday, 3 to uh, three p.m. GMT will be my streaming on YouTube channel here. Like, subscribe, put in the bell notification so you know when my next live is going to be here. Like I mentioned, if you want to have uh, any new discussions, let me know in the link down below and uh, just I'll read them and I'll read all the comments. Usually I'll read all of them and then I'll take some notes and hopefully I will see you guys next time, right? Okay, cool. Uh, let's see. <laughs> I'm starting to miss some comments now, so but I will, I will stop here because it's been going on for quite some time now, so I better uh, make a stop and uh, I can have to recover my voice. I can start to feel that my voice is losing. <laughs> and uh, so no problem. So I will see you guys all next time. And uh, yeah, Vicky say, have waves, that's <laughs> no problem. <laughs> stay safe, everybody. Yeah, stay at home and remember, wash your hands and uh, keep the distance. You know, it sounds a bit weird, but we have to do that, right? Uh, yeah, but yeah, I just want to see everybody healthy at the end of this and uh, especially like, when we can able to go out and shoot again and uh, join me, you know, for photo walk uh, whenever I announce them. So yeah, hope to see you guys all. all right, until next time, I see you guys. Bye for now.